Thanks for inviting. It's great to be here. I don't know if you have a clue, but you look absolutely fantastic in that theater. I'm a bit blasted. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today and that we have together, let's say, 45 minutes uh, to talk about one of the topics of today. To talk about one of the topics that is changing our complete environment. Your jobs, your future, your work, society. That we have 45 minutes of time to talk about one of the things, about the digital revolution. I know it's quite a bit of a dramatic opener, but that's a movie theater that has been seeing drama. And being honest, digital transformation and revolution is just about to start. It is impacting massively in every of our environments and just going to be the differentiator for the future. So let's start digital transformation, digital revolution. Can everybody of you do me a favor and close your eyes for a couple of seconds? We are in a movie theater, great motion pictures. What is it that comes to your mind when you think digital revolution? What do you picture? How does it sound like? Everybody? Get it? I'd assume there are quite a lot of robots, artificial intelligence. Well, I can listen to it. When I think about digital revolution, that's what comes. At least I saw some people smiling. For those who don't have a clue what that was, or what that is, I pictured it. That is a 128K dial-in modem, which I apparently won in a radio quiz in the year 2000 with two years of free internet. And that was the exact sound that came with that. Why is that revolutionary to me? I always loved music. And back in the days, my 14-year-old self wasn't willing to spend my pocket money on buying CDs. So I was literally sitting in front of the radio waiting for my favorite song to tape it to then put it into my Walkman and listen to it. With having that, my revolution started. I was able to go online and download my favorite song. First song I ever downloaded, I still remember that, study room of my dad, Bloodhound Gang, fire water burn, the roof is on fire. In a magnificent like 10 minutes, huh? Uh, why do I tell you that? Because it might sound a bit odd to have somebody on stage talking backwards and dwelling in, 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 in the... But that's not the case. It's about the speed, huh? That moment when I sat there is less than 20 years ago. Today, if I want to listen to a song, I mean, we all do that, huh? You take out your phone, you just go online, you buy it with a click, you download the song to not only listen to it when you sit in front of your PC, but you take it with you, and honestly, every one of you is getting frustrated if the download time is more than 15 seconds. And it's even more advanced. You don't even need to buy the song anymore. If you really want to listen to it, yeah, you just need Wi-Fi or connection. Go to YouTube, Deezer, Spotify, Apple Music, whatsoever, and just download it. That is where we are. That's what the digital revolution is about. It's about speed. First of all, it's about speed and then what you have. But revolution is such a big word. There are different types of revolutions, political, social, economical, technology revolutions. There's one thing that, per definition, every revolution has in common, which is the outcome. A revolution is a change that occurs rapidly, massively, and is leading to a fundamental transformation. Just take the example that we had with the music. I don't want to bore you too long with statistics, but in about 25 minutes, when I'm going to be finished with my little speech, there will be 30 million euros spent online. 30 million. You know when the first book was sold on Amazon? 1997, 22 years ago. From 22 years to literally 1 million spent per minute. In half an hour nowadays, there are about half a billion, 500 million text messages sent 
And that doesn't even include WhatsApps. First text message ever sent, 1992. That is acceleration. That is massive. If you think that's a lot, guess how many mails will have been sent in half an hour nowadays? Six and a half billion. Six and a half billion to picture that. If every one of us being in that room would start writing 300 mails from now on till the end of our lives, so assuming for 60 years, then you have that amount. For 60 years in just half an hour, that's massive. That's speed. That's rapid. But is it actually a fundamental transformation? So what makes it fundamental? For me, a fundamental transformation always comes with change, change of behavior. Only if I change behavior and see behavioral change also in environment, then it's becoming fundamental. Looking into the private life again, um, I don't know how you do it, but in my 33 years, I've never had an appointment in a bank. Look one generation up. I think a lot of our parents still had that one banker that was accompanying them from beginning to all their investments during their lives. I do all of that online. I do also all the other things that I need to organize in my life online, by the way, which is sometimes probably stupid. For me, it's easier to check things via WhatsApp, online reservations, talk with chatbots than calling or just dropping by, which is probably stupid. It's even that far that when I'm on TripAdvisor looking for a restaurant, I just filter on those where I can make a reservation online. Stupid, I probably lose the best places where I could go. But that's kind of the fundamental transformation that you're in. Last week, my husband and I, we've been in Zurich, um, sitting at the lake, which was a very, very nice place, and literally sitting next to the tourist info. And instead of going there and buying the ticket and getting the information, I just downloaded the app and do that. I'm extremely sure that every one of you is doing the exact same. Private. That's you. But to be fundamental, it also needs to reach a larger environment. And I want to think with you together about your closer environment. I would make a bet at least half of you are the IT support for your family. Parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Yeah. Setting up Wi-Fi printers, installing PCs at Christmas, I, all that stuff. It is not only you that change. With you taking over that role, knowing that technology, living that technology every day, you enable that change happening there. And it's not only that your grandparents and your surroundings adopt the technology, it is also that they have a different integration. As an IT professional, what I did a couple of years ago, I moved my whole family to the exact same IT operating model. So the exact same provider of hardware and to the exact same provider of software. That in case somebody gives me a call and said they have no clue on how to forward a WhatsApp via mail, which happens, then I know exactly what to do. The thing is, it is not only that they use it. So my grandma, I got her an iPad in the age of 75, is using that iPad for Googling her morning cereals, but it's also integrating her. Last year, my, my grandparents had a bit of a difficult time. My granddad was in hospital for a while quite heavy, uh, when a young doctor came and told my grandma all the things that are there, and he told her, well, that's too complicated now, but ask your grandchildren to Google it. You know how cool it is to hear the story that she said? She took her tablet and said, like, was, guess I already did. So that's the fundamental transformation that you have. You integrate people into that environment. Um, taking that definition of revolution, and I think we're able to bring that one step forward, digital revolution for me, is that change that occurs rapidly, massively, is leading to that fundamental transformation, and is fueled by technology. Stay with me. That was all private. Let's go into the real stuff. Let's go into business, into corporates, into environments where you are. I finished my bachelor's in the year 2008. In 2008, I decided to start working for Atos, Atos Consulting. Atos is an IT professional service provider, about 120,000 employees globally, quite sustainable, leader in, in, in Europe and, and in the world, which mainly earns their money by ensuring that large corporates and companies have a running IT. Servers, you have their laptops, but also like networks and everything around. And while in private life I got my first smartphone in the year 2008, started downloading apps, developing them myself, 
I can tell you, back in the days, none of that happened in larger environments. Gartner, and I hope you can read that a bit, um, pictured the emergent technologies back in 2008 like that, and that's a bit more than 10 years ago. What you can see there is that tablet PCs were in the slope of enlightenment. Tablet PC, not to compare that to a Microsoft Surface or an iPad, what you have today, but a laptop where you have that movable screen. E-papers, same face. Things like cloud computing, 3D printing, just like triggers of new technology. I can tell you, back in the days, IT was not part of product and production and of the business. It was still an enabler. It was still the supporting function to ensure that the servers were blinking, that the network was available, and that everybody was having a PC. First time when I really saw that changing, and that was the first really, really cool project, was in the year 2013, where we had a project for a manufacture of white goods. Fridges, washing machines, tumble dryers, and stuff like that. And they had a new CIO who said, like, you know what, in the future, nobody is going to buy our product anymore. Everybody needs to wash their clothes, but nobody's going to spend that much money into one of our products. We're prime. There will be people who have cheaper products, and they will go over there. And he came out of a technology-driven, very, very cool idea, which I think is the first IoT project I've ever been working on, to take all the washing machines, to net the information together in a platform, collect all the data, analyze the personal behavior that you have by washing, and instead of buying the machine, you just pay per wash load. Brilliant idea. Completely failed. Why? That was driven by the technical engineers. Technical engineers sitting there, oh, well, it would be cool just to like, bring it together. Which is really, really interesting, because in the year 2013, Technology came up with the idea to bring things together in such a platform and use the data. But the market didn't respond. Business wasn't there. Today, an internet connection on a fridge is kind of standard. Everything that you say about connected home, that's how it started. It started with some techie guys, but failed because the business integration was missing. I think one year later, there was a cool project that we did uh, with a complete different industry, with a company that is producing fertilizers. So they make their money by selling, producing fertilizers. Already before the whole sustainability discussions and economical discussions that we see nowadays with Fridays of Future, there was always already a social discussion back in the time that over-fertilizing the ground is faithfully harming the ecosystem that you have. They feared that they would be disrupted by somebody else replacing their product, substituting it with something that was less harming for the economical environment. And they said, well, it would be cool if we would just use the right amount, the exact right amount of fertilizer. We developed together with them a system that in real time you would be able to make an analysis of the ground to say what is the exact right amount of fertilizer, and while going by, just apply that right amount. Imagine what that simple technical solution had as an impact on that company. That would mean that they would sell less fertilizer. Because if I just bring the right amount, then I'm not over-fertilizing, good, okay, good for environment, but for my business, it's bad. I am eventually going to sell less of my product. A thing in a solution that is completely and still in place developed with new functions since years. I think agriculture is one of the industries that is the most digitized since the beginning of that. Because you are able, in that case, to see compared to the white good portion that business was involved. If the business would have not understood that it might be necessary to sell less of their fertilizer but get a long-term connection with their customers, they would have not been agreeing to that, like with the washing machines. Same year. Something came up, and I think that became a bit of a classic, uh, predictive maintenance. We've been working with a theme park provider, like you know the ones with the roller coasters and, and, and things. Um, and they had that one main attraction. <laughs> that one main attraction broke down too often. What happens when you're in a theme park, you go there for the main attraction, and you're absolutely disappointed when you're not able to ride. Not talking about the larger queues at the other things that you can do. 
What we did together with them is using the sensors that they had and think about that predictive model. Doing a predictive analysis, figuring out what are the patterns to ensure that you have those maintenance windows at night. Those are the combinations where you see that we've been moving away from the fact that IT is a pure supporting function becoming an inevitable part of business and product. Think quickly about that. What are the products that you know that have no IT included or in production or in selling? Literally none of them. When going back to the definition, and I think that is the final thing that, that, that I want to say to that, the ongoing digital revolution is first and foremost, it's disrupting, disrupting to business. It's leading to that fundamental change and it's not longer technology driving it, but business demands are driving the technology. That's the digital revolution. Still, there's one thing which might stay in the room while we talk about digital revolution, the impact. What is digital? You might say, Annie, you should know. You're heading digital department within Atos, and actually I do, everything between Luxembourg and Moscow. And guess what my answer is when I talk to our customers first? Digital is everything and nothing. From a technology point of view, because the technologies that you use to be successful are changing so fast. Something that you use today will be bought tomorrow, disrupted the day after tomorrow, and replaced by something completely new that you can't even think about. 20 years ago, downloading 10 minutes, 15 seconds a day. So the speed is so fast, that at least for me and at least for us, digital, of course, supported by technology, but digital is more of a story. And that's why I'm going to use the remaining time that we have about to give you a couple of ideas what we're doing. So digital linking business and technology. First thing that I usually do when talking about digital is saying it starts with one question. What is relevant data? How do I get that data and how do I store it? You all know that from your studies. I don't know how many lectures you do in your study program. You also need to decide what of all the information that you get is relevant for you. It's the same in every business, huh? Think about that. If you have, for example, a car manufacturer, the data that is relevant for a car manufacturer is probably machine data, how the machines are operating, what's the quality of the parts produced and stuff like that, and how to get it probably by sticking sensors, is completely different from a bank. Take a bank. A bank wants to know about you. They want to know you as a customer. What's the money that you get? What's the money that you spend? Are you too often in the debt or not? How do you get that data? You cannot put a sensor on you. Although the question remains the same. What's the relevant data? How do I get it and how do I store it? Of course, there are multi-different technologies underlying that. Industry for Zero, IoT, PLM, MES, that's all there. And in five years from now, there will probably be 15 different other technologies underneath there. But the question remains the same. What's relevant? How do I get it? When I got the data that I need for my business, the next question that I have is, what do I do with that data to generate an insight that provides me with a competitive advantage against my competition? I want to understand how I can use that data to improve the business and operations that I have. Remember that, that, that theme park provider with the roller coaster, the exact same. They had more or less all the data. How could they use that to have that advantage? Again, all technologies underneath there. Data science, analytics, big data, machine learning, automation, robotics. Put it all underneath there. There will be new things coming, but the question is the same. Business aspect. Third one is when you've gained that insight, brilliant, congrats. How do you ensure that that insight really impacts your business? How can you ensure that whatever you do either turns into one of those four levers? Giving you more revenue, giving you more profit, giving you happier customers or happier employees. What is it that you need to do using all those insights, using all the data to make that happen? A last topic, and that's again in my digital story, in our digital story, which is again a bit technology-wise, which is new technology. Internally, it has the working title, all the fancy new stuff. 
Because what also happens to you is that you find organizations where you have those enthusiasts saying, ah, you know what, Anna, I'd always wanted to do something with HoloLenses. Well, you have that as well. Huh? But, but that's, for me, the digital story that you have. It's an end-to-end -end picture that is heavily integrating together with business, understanding it, understanding the demand, because only then it's meaningful and supported by technology. Digital story, not only digital technology. What does that mean? And I'm going to give you some examples that we're currently working on, because the other ones are already a bit, bit ago. First, don't ever think that the companies, the corporates, you are probably also going to start working at, starting at zero. On the contrary. Take example, we're working with an um, airplane manufacturer. An airplane manufacturer knows exactly well what data is relevant for them and how to get it. An average airplane has about 1,400 sensors. Well, and they need it, and they need to get it, and they know how to get it because they need to steer that the flight is still safe. 1,400 sensors. One hour of flight is generating four and a half terabyte of data. Just one hour. Don't come to them and tell, oh, well, I have an idea of a new sensor that you could add. Forget about it. They know exactly that. But still, I would bet every one of you has been experiencing the fact at the airport, dear ladies and gentlemen, we're very sorry to inform you that our flight needs to be cancelled due to unforeseen technical problems. How can it be that although you have 1,400 sensors, although you have all that data, four and a half tera, that you're not able to foresee that you have maintenance? That's a digital story. We're currently working together with several airlines exactly on exploiting that. How can you use the data that you have to generate that insight? Because thinking about it, having an airplane not leaving from the ground, what kind of money is behind there? Dissatisfied people flying, having a new airplane, having an additional maintenance window. We talk about hundreds and thousands of years that you have. Other example, other industry, completely different. Pharmaceutical. Pharma companies are known for what? They are good in research and development. That's how they make their money. So usually they have people in their environment, they are excellent in block number two. You can give them data and they find the patterns and they figure out this is works, that's a correlation that is done and helping and not. Usually those companies have no clue about the other parts. They are not in direct contact with their end customers. We've been working together, and there was an extremely interesting project beginning of the year with a producer of enzymes. They also figured out they could be easily disrupted by somebody copying their formula, being way, way cheaper. And they said, with the enzymes that we sell, we want to ensure that our customers are able to increase their harvest. And what they've been picking is, uh, it's quite a bad business, which is palm oil business. But I said it's high volume, it's low margin. We want our customers to invest in our enzyme to increase the yield. And they said, let's go from our typical things that we usually do, and let's make a test and see if we are able to provide our customers not only with the enzymes, but also with a guarantee that they are able to increase their yield. Problem about palm oil? It is growing in the jungle. In that particular case, in the jungle of Malaysia. Very specific, four hours drive away from Kuala Lumpur into an area where you didn't even have connectivity. To ensure that they are able to do their data science, they need data. How can a company that is focused on producing those enzymes have a clue about getting data in real time out of the jungle in Malaysia to their headquarters in the middle of Europe. So how can you make that a digital story? Extremely interesting project. Had a lot of our young teams, we have a so-called IoT masterclass, um, has been working on that, and they have been preparing to one thing. They've been setting up here in Amstelveen like a box on how to measure that. It's an edge computer that you have that processes the information locally on site to say, like, now is the right moment to yield and only sends that information because the amount of data that you would need to transfer by uh, way too expensive. 
what they did is they built it up over here, shipped it over to Malaysia. We had very, very proud young colleagues that we sent over there. <laughs> very funny pictures. But guess what? All the equipment that you get over here just works till 45 degrees Celsius and 65% humidity. Have a thunderstorm in the jungle of Malaysia. Whole thing crack. So that is the things that you that you come to, but but you are able to help them to make that a story and to make that an impact. Other great example, I think. Um, somebody here who speaks Finnish. One, my hero. Finnish is one of the most complex languages that you can even imagine about. There's a joke in German that they say that a secret service would use Finnish for decoding everything and their secret messages because it's too complex. I think about till about two years ago, even Siri wasn't working in Finnish. Huh? We have a customer in Finland that we work with, and actually that is a challenge. Huh? Um, if you have business in Finland with Finnish customers, you want to talk with them in Finnish, you want to write with them in Finnish. And that is a company that is having a service desk there, and when somebody is writing a mail, they want to have a reply in Finnish. In every other country, and you probably know that, you'll get a service desk that is somewhere sitting in India, Tenerife, or wherever. You can't do that in Finnish. I think a couple of people in Estonia are speaking Finnish, but that's basically it. So what we've been doing together with them is to set up a machine learning algorithm that is scanning every mail that is coming in, figuring out the patterns, and combining that with a sentiment analysis. So that based on the sentiment that you saw out of the mail, yeah, happy customer, okay, we can provide a standard answer, or no, better have a professional answering to that one. So that's the world, huh? That's the difference that you see that are the changes that you see where business is really impacted and integrating together with technology. Having said that, and coming, coming closer to, to the final of the things, what are the things that I th would like to give away today, that I would like to give to you. Number one, I think change is inevitable. You can see a lot of studies that the companies that are able to disrupt themselves, also in that direction, are the ones that are successful, are the ones that are earning more money in the end, the ones who understood that this is the way of future, that this is the way of development, that they are going there. Number two, to be successful in digital transformation, it needs to that end-to-end -end story. And that's actually also where you are coming into place. You are digital natives, huh? You've been growing up with the same things from the beginning. You are the ones who are able to help companies doing that. Out of a personal experience of my last 11 years in professional life, don't come into companies that have been operating for years and tell them how the world works. They know exactly what they do. Every company that I've been working with so far, and we have quite a few of them, is good in at least one of those areas. They just need support in the others to really make it a success. I think takeaway or hope number three, as soon as you will start working, you need to help the environments that you are in to change. For you, it's natural. People are afraid of change. There's the fear that the jobs are going to be away and replaced by humanoid robots. Take away that fear of people. Make clear that it is good to change. Help them. Help the organization to change. The role that you can play with your background, but also with your environment and also with the technical know-how. Number four, um, I think it's just the start of the digital revolution. There are the foundations. I think things are spreading. Technology will not stop. We are only going in now. As we're in the cinema, just let me do that one last core thing. Katniss Everdeen, Hunger Games. When you burn, you burn with us. Like, yeah, but that's exactly the point. You are the ones bringing the digital revolution. Help the organizations to make that happen. You, with your background, to do that. After. Having talked 30 minutes, globally 30 million dollars have been spent, 500 million text messages sent, 5.6 million mails. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions.